it appears that the recording has started. So again, there's no rush. I'll just trim this, this, you know, me speaking off at the very beginning, but uh, apparently when it was set up, it was set to start immediately. So just so you know, we're, we're recording just a tiny bit early. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start in just a few more minutes, just trying to give people time to log on. Just a minute more and we'll get started. Thanks for everyone's patience. Hello everyone, and thank you all for joining us for our CDC Dental Public Health mm -hmm. Lecture Series. Um, we're gonna get started and I'm gonna just do a brief welcome. Um, just for everyone's awareness, I'm Dr. Gina Thorne Evans and I'm the director of the CDC Dental Public Health Residency Program and also serve as the senior dental officer or team lead for the surveillance investigations and research team for the Division of Oral Health at CDC. And I'll move on now to the purpose of this lecture series. Um, really what we're trying to accomplish is really for the uh, dental public health residents to gain a better understanding of the 10 dental public health competencies. And so the intended audience is current dental public health residents um, and any prospective residents, but really anyone that's interested in the field of dental public health. Uh, each webinar has a different um, speaker and we're trying to really broaden the topic <clears throat> as well as the, um, the scope. So whereas sometimes we may focus more on epi um, things, the goal is to really expand out to, to policy and other issues um, that are important in dental public health. Also wanted to notify everyone that for upcoming uh, lectures, you can scan the QR code and subscribe to the Dental Public Health um, Residency Program email series. And I just want to make a special note of um, the communications team that we have in the Division of Oral Health. They've been doing an awesome job with really promoting all of the uh, lecture series and just really enhancing it um, to get a broader audience. And I think Ms. Brailer, um, one of the communication staff just put in a link um, into the chat. So I'm gonna go into the dental public health um, residency, the definition for dental public health, and really it's the science and art of preventing and controlling dental diseases and promoting dental health through organized community efforts. It is that form of dental practice that serves the community as a patient rather than the individual. It is concerned with the dental education of the public and applied dental research and with the administration of group dental care programs, as well as the prevention and control of disease on a community basis. And as I mentioned earlier, there's 10 
dental public health competencies that define the knowledge and practice base. And they were developed by the American Association of Public Health Dentistry, along with the American Board of Dental Public Health. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our next um, lecture series speaker, and it's Ms. Mary Foley, who is the Executive Director for the Medicaid Medicare CHIP Services Dental Association. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Ms. Foley, and um, she has done a number of great things um, over many, many years, and so I'm really happy to have her. And just for those that may not know, Ms. Foley received um, her license to practice dental hygiene in Massachusetts, um, and she holds a master's in public health with a concentration in epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of Massachusetts School of Public Health and Policy, Health Policy. After 20 years in clinical practice, Ms. Foley moved into public health um, serving as the director of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Office of Oral Health. In this role, she was responsible for oral health surveillance, access, prevention, education, pro and education programs. She was the Region 1 Head Start Oral Health Consultant to the um, Health Resources and Services Administration and the Office of Head Start, providing technical assistance to Head Start um, and early Head Start programs throughout the New England area. In 2005, Ms. Foley became the project director for the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry's national campaign, Improving Perinatal and Infant Oral Health, where she further served as an advisor and editor to the California and New York State Perinatal and Infant and toddler oral health guidelines. Later in her career, she served as the Dean of the Forsyth School of Dental Hygiene um, in Boston, where she launched the school's first master's program for dental hygienists. She has worked for Medicaid, Medicare, CHIP Services, um, Dental Association since 2009, advancing oral health policy in Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP uh, beneficiaries. It's with great pleasure to turn it over to Ms. Foley. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Thornton Evans. So I'm gonna just share my screen now. And um, let me just do a sound check. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Okay, very great. Clearly, yes. Okay. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Thornton Evans. And I just wanna take a moment to thank, um, you know, everyone at CDC for all your help and assistance in, in, in bringing this, um, this webinar together and helping to prepare this. Um, I'm seeing little hearts go up my <laughs> go up my slide, and um, I'm not used to that, so <laughs> it's a little distracting. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to have an opportunity to direct my comments today to the dental public health residents. You know, as a dental hygienist, we don't have the opportunity to um, go through a dental public health residency, so um, it's really um, wonderful to be able to engage with, with all of you at this time. Um, my career, as um, Dr. Thornton Evans said, has really spanned um, and gone through a lot of different pathways. And it is from those different pathways that I'm just gonna share with you this morning, some of my um, knowledge and experience and maybe my perspective too a little bit on how we can advance um, oral health equity because that's the point that we're at today. You know, we've made a lot of strides over the last 20 years, and, and now we have an opportunity to really move things, things forward. Um, so with that, um, today we're going to talk about how Medicaid programs um, have evolved and how we can together um, work to advance oral health equity for everybody. So just to give you a little background, the Medicaid Medicare CHIP Services Dental Association is a national membership nonprofit organization that was um, organized back in 2004 um, on, in California by the Secretary of State. Our, we, we actually, our members involve the state Medicaid dental program um, directors, but in more recent years, we've expanded membership to include 
those corporations and businesses and vendors that actually administer programs now, contract with Medicaid programs, you know them as managed care organizations or third party administrators, because we believe that they are now an extension of state Medicaid programs. So again, public-private partnerships, you've heard that before, um, we couldn't be more involved with public-private partnerships um, today. And so our goal is to see how we can really advance our goals together, right, to achieve this equity that we talk about. Our vision, we just came off of a board meeting this past weekend. So our vision for our organization is optimal oral health for all Medicaid, Medicare, and children's health insurance program beneficiaries. We're gonna talk a little bit about how those, who those people are today. Um, and our mission, of course, is to accelerate oral health equity for Medicare, Medicare, and CHIP, Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP members through innovation, program improvement, policy development and advocacy. And it is in that spirit that I'm here with you today. So thank you again. The learning objectives for today's session is hopefully by the end of today, you will have a increased knowledge and understanding of Medicaid, a little bit on Medicare and the Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, my hope is that you'll gain understanding of how federal legislation and regulation affects state Medicaid policy, its administration, its practice. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about current policy how it works, trends in administration, and the use of dental services by Medicaid beneficiaries, some emerging topics and priorities um, at the federal and state levels, and technology and how technology is helping us advance our, our goals. So let's talk a little bit about government programs, dental public health programs and where they came from, okay? This is a, um, a, a pretty succinct summary, but it'll give you an idea of, of where we've come and, and where we're at, right? So in 1934, we had the Great Depression, right? And during that time, states became overwhelmed because the number of poor people in the country was just, um, it, it was really tremendous. And so the federal government at that time said, you know, we really, we really need to take some level of responsibility. We have to step up and do something for the poor in this country. And it was at that point that we had the birth of the Social Security Act, okay? Um, and we fast forward a little bit to the 1960s where we had the Kerr-Mills Act. <clears throat> and this was when we started to see that people needed medical assistance, especially the aged, right? That as people were <clears throat> aging and that um, healthcare was not available, Again, the federal government said, we need to do something. We need to provide some assistance for the age. In 1965, that's when programs became a little bit more grounded, okay? That's during the Johnson administration that we saw um, the birth of Medicare and Medicaid. These became entitlement programs, meaning that if you were eligible for Medicaid or for Medicare based on the eligibility criteria, you would be entitled okay, to healthcare services, all right? And we'll talk a little bit about what the um, eligibility requirements are for both of them, um, but right now we'll continue on, on this path of just kind of looking at the history. In 1967, the EPSDT program came about, I'll tell you what that stands for. It stands for Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. It was a specific program established for children, birth, to age 20 or under 21. So as soon as they turn 21, they would age out of the EPSDT program. The EPSDT program marked um, a new term called medical necessity. If again, you were eligible under this entitlement program, you weren't just entitled to services, you were entitled to all services that were deemed medical necessity. We're gonna talk a little bit further on about what medical necessity actually means and how it is actually defined because it's defined differently by states, okay? In 1997, the Children's Health Insurance Program came into play. Now the Children's Health Insurance Program was a program that was established because the federal government recognized that those that were eligible for Medicaid fell into um, an, an income category that was very, very low. But there were people that, that fell into a, an income category just above um, the Medicaid elig income eligibility category that still didn't have access to healthcare. And that these children um, weren't receiving necessary and important and essential healthcare services. So the Children's Health Insurance Program was an effort by the federal government to close that gap 
between um, between what we would call one level of income, where um, where families um, worked had full time employment and full health care benefits, and those that fell um, below federal poverty levels that qualified for Medicaid to really close that gap to those children and um, from families where parents may have worked you know, but, but didn't have health care coverage. So that was in 1997. Now, during that time, some of the programs of the Children's Health Insurance Program were housed in dental public, in, in public health agencies, not necessarily the Medicaid agency. And over the last 20 and 30 years, that has actually, um, that's actually changed quite a bit. In 2009, CHIPRA, which is the RA stands for the reauthorization of the Children's Health Ins Insurance um, Program, that um, added dental. So when it first came out in 1997, as we said, it provided health care coverage for these children that fell in that, in that hole, okay, but there was no um, mandate for dental. Um, some of our dental colleagues at the Children's Dental Health Project worked for a number of years to really ensure that um, that a dental benefit um, was included in, in the CHIP program. And they were successful at that when it was reauthorized in 2009. You're all very aware of the, um, um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and that came out in 2010. And that was really a game changer. It was a game changer for a lot of the ways in which Medicaid is administered in the States. It was, um, there was lots of implications for dental public health programs, what we call oral health programs in the states as well. Funding really shifted um, from a lot of funding initially was lost in public health programs and went to Medicaid to, to compensate for increased enrollments. And that seems to have leveled off quite a bit. Um, in 2018, we had action for dental health. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about where we've come since 2018, 2020, of course, and then the pandemic. Um, but that gives you an overall of kind of the um, what's happened over the last, you know, 50 plus years. Now, I, I really like this org chart, uh, and, and it may be that things have changed a little bit, but I think it's a really important org chart to help um, us all understand all these different agencies we talk about, right? And we are, we're all dental public health colleagues here, you know, on this, on this call. And so it's like, where do we fit? Where do we come together? How does it all work? So in government, just to give you a little history lesson, right? We have the executive office and then we have Congress, right? And so in under the executive office, the administration, we call it, we have all these departments, all right? One of which is the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And again, titles may change, just so you know, over the years with different administrations. But this org chart is intended to give you an idea of all the different agencies that fall under Health and Human Services. So when the federal government releases its annual budget, dollars go out, funding goes out to each of the departments, right? And a big chunk obviously goes to the Department of Health and Human Services. And this is really a very elementary description. So I'm sure there's a more eloquent way to describe this, but this is how I'm gonna describe it today. Health and Human Services then allocates their budget. And those dollars go to each of the little agencies or sub agencies, as you can see. Now, if you look at, and I'm, I'm sorry that this, that some of the font is small, but you can see some of the different agencies that are starred here, right? We have the Administration for Children and Families, ACF. That's where Head Start is housed. And that's where Head Start programs are funded. We have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's where all our Medicaid, Medicare and CHIP funding gets funneled through. Okay, we have HRSA, right? The Health Resources and Services Administration. Many of you are familiar or, we, or will become familiar with HRSA. We have maternal and child health programs. We have um, the Division um, Bureau of Health Workforce. We have um, primary care, all of that, federally, health, federally qualified health center funding, all of that comes through, through HRSA. We have the Indian Health Service, right? We have National Institutes of Health where NIDC CR is, right? And of course, we have our partners here with CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, right? So we also have many others. Why did I start the ones I did? Because these are the agencies that we work, I would say, probably the closest with. Now you see over on the right-hand side, we have the Office of Inspector General. When the CHIP, um, CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program was reauthorized, um, 
the whole notion of quality, right, became really, really rose to the forefront. There was um, a lot more talk about fraud, waste, and abuse, um, a lot more discussion about um, becoming more accountable for using taxpayers' dollars. So a lot, you started to see a lot more um, audits that are taking place, and you're going to hear a little bit about that in, in the session today, too. So I have that started because, because we, we do a lot with that. Um, you, many of you on this call may may work or have some kind of a connection with some of the other agencies as well that are in here, but these are the ones that I've started that I that I personally have worked very closely with over the last number of years. Now, this is just a diagram of CMS. Okay. Now, CMS is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so we talk about CMS and we say, what, you know, what, what is CMS? Well, they are centers, plural, right? And so that means that there are several centers in CMS. And just like the former org chart we were looking at, you know, dollars are funneled, you know, to CMS through the Department of Health and Human Services. They go to CMS and then CMS again to the various centers and the various offices. And so as you can see on the right side of your screen here, okay, there's the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid um, Innovation, the Center for Medicare, the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, the Center for Program Integrity, and the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight. So it's when we talk about Medicaid, the title of this presentation today is Medicaid 101. You know, you're gonna get the teeniest little snapshot today because Medicare and Medicare, they are just, they're monsters, right? They're huge, huge programs. It's a steep learning curve, you know, and the more we're involved with it, the more you kind of get to know it, but nothing is, is stationary anymore, right? We know everything continues to evolve. And so we'll continue to see how these centers here on the right may change. We may find that one, one center here uh, may disappear. It may merge with another center. We may have a new center that comes on board. So again, nothing is stationary. This is where we're at today, okay? So now we're gonna go back and talk a little bit more about and focus on, on Medicaid. But I wanted to give you a sense of where Medicaid fits in the big picture. So Medicaid is the entitlement program. I explained that already. Enacted in 1965 under the Johnson administration. Now Medicaid is jointly administered by federal and state governments. And what that means is both the federal government and states pay for the administration and, and for service delivery, okay? And co to cover services in each of the states for eligible, okay, beneficiaries. It pays for medically necessary, you heard me use that word before, healthcare services, which are defined in statute for the EPSDT program, where minimum income and eligibility criteria are set by the federal government. Now the states do have the option to expand that eligibility criteria. Some states keep it very low, exactly where the federal government standard is. Some states expand it and allow more people to be eligible for those healthcare services. So what you see, you're gonna hear me say this more, more than once today, what you see in one state Medicaid program is only one state Medicaid program because there's tremendous variability in the way in which states administer their programs. And it starts from all the way from um, enrollment to the types of services, to coverage of services, to reimbursement rates and, and medical necessity. So states variability by eligibility, benefits, and payment. So again, we said it was a joint federal and state program, um, which provides this access to care. It's responsible to maintain coverage, so payment for individuals that fall under that criteria and for specific benefits. It ensures adequate, it's, it's, it needs to ensure adequate provider participation. So states are responsible to the federal government under their state plan, okay, and to ensure that all eligibles in that state, okay, will receive the medical necessity care that they um, are eligible for. And, and the states um, coordinate with Medicare, if you may have heard the term dual eligibles. So again, we said that Medicaid, okay, is income eligibility, Medicare, is more age and disability eligibility. So if you have an individual 
who is 65 years or older and low income, they would be a dual eligible, okay? Um, they are responsible to contain costs, right? They have a responsibility to ensure that costs and, and services are efficiently and effectively administered and to maintain program integrity. Program integrity, if you're not aware of this term, it's a, it's a broad term that basically means we have to keep a handle on fraud, waste, and abuse because it is government um, administered taxpayer dollars. And so we have a responsibility working in these programs to maintain that program integrity and fiscal accountability. <clears throat> so again, Medicaid, I keep saying this, is a federal and state partnership. And the way in which the, the partnership works is, a, is, is, is based on formulas for matching funds. Um, if you imagine that state pays 50% and the federal government pays 50%, well, that is true in some cases, but in some cases when a state is, is, um, has uh, fewer resources, then the federal government may have a higher share than the state, okay? And during times of crisis, you'll often see what, like when the, when, um, the Affordable Care Act was rolled out, um, because the federal government really wanted to encourage states to participate and to, and to um, expand their eligibility, the federal government paid 100% of the state's share for a number of years while those new people were first getting enrolled in the program. And then after a number of years, year by year, they would decrease their federal um, share and, and the state would pick up that federal share. Giving. So, so the federal government often will give states um, a time to you know, um, take on that those extra enrollees and then um, and cover them and get their, their program set. And then they'll kind of back off and the state will take it and, and run with it. Perfect example, not to digress here, but a perfect example is when COVID hit and we had massive, massive enrollments in Medicaid and the federal government provided lots of resources um, to support states to ensure that people didn't lose benefits and had, had access to healthcare coverage that they needed. Um, so anyway, states have the flexibility in the administration of its Medicaid programs um, within those broad federal guidelines. Now, keep in mind that all Medicaid comes from federal law, right? And so the federal law provides that basis, that foundation, but then how it's actually administered goes into state law, right? And then the state then determines how that's gonna happen. So the states can then, it, it will administer the programs, some will contract with third party administrators, you've heard of them, or what we call now managed care plans. There's a difference between them. We're gonna talk a little bit about what that is. And it serves as a contact point for states, uh, for CMS. They also pay the claims. Now let's talk a little bit about Medicaid eligibility. So we said already that the federal government determines the baseline eligibility, right? It's income, all right? But this varies by state. The federal statute creates it and that changes, but it's established by a minimum criteria based on whatever the federal poverty level is. Federal poverty levels are adjusted annually. And so eligibility is adjusted annually, as you can see. The state government must uphold the federal mandate, but they can opt to expand it as we said, okay? And we've seen that, you know, also. <clears throat> The basic um, requirements for Medicaid eligibility is, is that income level, okay, and whatever resources. There's also non-financial basic requirements. That is, if you're going to be eligible for Medicaid in Massachusetts, you must live in Massachusetts. So there's state residence requirements. You have to be a citizen or a qualified alien, and you have to have a social security number. Again, there's state flexibility to cover optional groups as well under waiver, under waiver programs. So you've heard of waivers. So if you have a law and you wanna waive some of the specificity of the law, okay, then there's waivers. That there's actually authorities, federal authorities in place that states can apply for to waive it. So for instance, if a state wanted to um, create a separate program for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they could potentially develop a waiver okay, to give that particular population the, the special services, the special coverage that they need that may be different than the, than the general adult Medicaid population, okay? So this, this is what that's about. 
So let's talk a little bit about um, Medicaid eligibility. And this slide is intended to give you an example of how federal mandates changed after the, um, after the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act came into play, okay? So before it, okay, um, who was eligible? We had low-income children and their parents were eligible. Pregnant women were eligible. Individuals with diabetes, uh, excuse me, with um, disabilities were eligible. Individuals age 65 and over were eligible. And the income levels, and this is really important, the income levels for eligibility prior to 2010, okay, were children under the age of six at 133% of the federal poverty level. That meant, okay, I want you to think about this. That means for a child, a young child, right, okay, under age six, the income level could be a little higher, okay, so that those children could receive all those well child visits and get all that coverage, right? But if the, once the child turns six, the poverty level actually had to drop even lower. They had to be actually even poorer to receive services, all right? This, this all changed with the Affordable Care Act, okay? And then again, look at what the, so for a family of three, the federal poverty level was $18,000 a year. So think about $18,000 a year for a family of three. Okay, now you have a child that's over age six, they're not going to get health care. That's what it was like before the Affordable Care Act. After the Affordable Care Act, <clears throat> we'll just skip down here. A lot of it changed, but it raised the eligibility for children ages six to nine in 20 states. So that was huge to get those kids to ensure that those kids still had, had care. It also um, introduced expansion to low-income adults who did not fall in one of the other categories. So the, the biggest group of adults that did not have, um, that were not eligible for Medicaid um, prior to the Affordable Care Act were what we call um, childless adults, single adults that were low income, okay? Um, and so now with the Affordable Care Act, they now became eligible. If their income was such, they now became eligible. This is just um, a map that shows where we are today, okay, with Medicaid expansion. And um, all of the navy blue states here are states that have actually added and adopted those expansions that we talked about. So there's still several states that have not adopted it, okay? And the federal government did um, offer states quite a bit of support once they expanded it. But I think, I think we're gonna see, you know, um, some changes as things go on, but it gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, again, with Medicaid um, enrollment, I'm gonna skip to it. We've got some better slides on that. So let's look at this slide and let's look at the inverse or disproportionate um, rates between enrollment and expenditures. Now, what I want you to look at here is the bottom row first, because the bottom row looks at who's enrolled, okay? So these are children, 38%, 39% of the whole Medicaid program are made up of children, okay? 15, almost 16% is this, is this medic, is non-expansion adults. These were your, your typical adults. 22% is this Medicaid expansion adults that I was just sharing with you, okay? 10% are adults age 65 and older, okay? And disabled adults are only 13%. But look at the way in which program expenditures go out. So if you look at the 13% of adults that have disabilities, they actually use up 33.6% of Medicaid dollars, okay? And look at almost 40% of all Medicaid enrollees are kids, but they only use up 16% of Medicaid dollars. So. And think about this, this is a state program, right? So the next slide I think is a better graphic. It shows it a little bit more easier. Again, you have kids um, that are, I guess this, you know, if you look at aged 65 and older, they're using 10% of them, okay? But they're using 22% of the dollars. It's disabled, 13% are disabled, but they're using 33% of the dollars. Okay, non-disabled adults make up 15%, okay? But they're using up 10% of the dollars. But this is the one 
This is the this is the EPSDT program that we're talking about. They make up almost 40% of all Medicaid enrollment, right? And yet they're using the least amount of the dollars. Now, this is just a, a slide that demonstrates um, the impact on COVID. All right, look at this down here in 2020. All right, and look at the growth in just two years. It was a 24, almost a 25% increase in enrollment just during the, as a result of the pandemic. Now, this will change drastically when the public health state of emergency is lifted. But right now, this is where the enrollment has gone. So imagine you're a state government with a state budget that has to be balanced at the end of the year. Unlike the federal government, they do not have to balance their budget. Every state is responsible to balance their budget. So when you say, why can't the state offer more services? Why can't they increase those reimbursement rates? All of a sudden, an event happens and boom, that enrollment goes up. But don't forget what we said. This is an entitlement program. People are entitled to these services if they fit that enrollment criteria. So if you have a program, you have a business, and all of a sudden your expenditures go up 25%, it's going to tip you, right? And so this is, so people need to understand it isn't quite always as easy as we think, okay? Again, another example of how Medicaid enrollment went up and continues to, to rise. So let's talk a little bit about spending and how to contain costs, because we talk about that, you know, when we, when we talk about how a state can administer a program, get the services, you know, advance this notion of equity that we're talking about, how are we going to do that, right? We have to balance our budget. Well, Medicaid spending and costs are driven by enrollment, what we talked about, right, by inflation, by policy changes, by events, crises that happen like we just saw. And so what are the levers? How can states manage these costs? Well, there's four basic levers. One is eligibility. If you change eligibility, right, if you change who's eligible for services, then that can, can change costs, right? So we said a few minutes ago that the federal government has the, has the baseline, that the, the foundational criteria for eligibility, and some states increase or expand that. If there's a crisis and the states and, and Medicaid will often be the budget buster for the state, then the state may have to reduce that eligibility to get back in check, right? So eligibility is one. Benefits. So you have this notion of medical necessity, right? And we have this idea that, that everyone is, that is eligible is entitled to the benefits and services that they need to maintain um, health, okay? And that's what medical necessity refers to. Okay, so you have this comprehensive, if we talk about dental, we have this comprehensive dental program with benefits, okay? We talk about for children, the EPSDT program, um, then we have this comprehensive benefit, okay? But what creates the actual eligibility on medical necessity? What does medical necessity mean for ortho? How can you tell that a child needs ortho? Where do you draw the line on that? We're going to show you in some of the slides what that means, okay? Um, I, I, I actually was remiss, and I should have mentioned that under federal law, under federal law, um, dental coverage is required for children, okay? But once a child turns 21 and they age out of the EPSDT program, states are not obliged to, to have dental services covered. And there lies the biggest problem that has existed for low-income adults in this country. Now, states have come to realize that if they don't fund a dental benefit, they're gonna pay for dental services because many of those folks are gonna end up in the emergency department, right? So, so states recognize this, but again, it's back to this whole idea of balancing, right? Balancing that budget. And so it's what kind of a benefit could we or should we have that will keep people out of the emergency room, that will keep our costs down and, and how do we balance that? And this is, this is what Medicaid folks are dealing with all the time. So we have eligibility, we have benefits, we have cost sharing. Now, cost sharing is not allowed in the EPSDT program because it's an entitlement program, okay? But for Medicaid adults, okay, it is, as I said, it's not mandated under federal law, so you can impose cost sharing. So isn't that what we do in um, commercial programs? Many of us have dental insurance, 
through our commercial employment, right? Through employment. And with that, we have maximum, we have caps, right? And, and so we get only so many dollars worth of services per year, and we may have to pay co-pays, right? That's what cost sharing is. Okay, that's not allowed in Medicaid for children, but it is for services that are not mandated under law. And so that's, that's another lever that can come into play. And then provider payments. So we know that very well, right? Reimbursement rates. How does the program contain, you know, manage and contain costs? You know, we all know that um, reimbursement rates for state Medicaid programs generally fall far, far below, right? Um, the commercial, their commercial counterparts in the same um, geographic areas. But that again is directly related to this notion of budget balancing that we've been talking about. Okay. So dental coverage in Medicaid. So again, we talked about the early, um, the EPSDT program, that it's an entitlement program. It covers all medical necessity services, but there are financial implications. And so when we talk about what is medically necessary and how that is defined, we call that policy. That's what the policy is. It's how do we design policy? What is the benefit? What is the, the policy, right? And so um, both the EPSDT program and the health insurance program has policy or benefits, right, that define that. Now, I said earlier about the EPSDT program and how that's for um, in the Medicaid, which is the Medicaid pediatric program. Right, And we said the Children's Health Insurance Program or the CHIP program were for children that fell at a higher level, okay, higher income level, whose families fell at a higher income level. Well, since the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, the trend has been to actually collapse these programs together, all right? So now we're seeing in most states, not all, there's still some separate states, but in most states, we're seeing that children that qualify for the CHIP program are really being covered by the same exact benefits of the EPSDT program, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about Medicaid administration. And Medicaid administration refers to the way in which a state rolls out and manages their benefits in their plans, okay? So there's these terms that we talk about, traditional fee-for-service. So traditional fee-for-service if I, if I asked most folks on this call, what does that mean? It means paying a fee for services that are rendered, all right? Now this gets a little complex, so kind of stay with me here. Back in the day, traditionally, dental providers had contracts or signed up and were enrolled directly with the state Medicaid program. It was direct administration by the state. We still have that in some states like New Hampshire, we have it in North Carolina. So the state administers the program, okay, and pays the pro providers directly a fee for service. They call that a traditional fee for service program, okay? Now, as states begin to contract, we had a lot of um, um, lawsuits back in the early 2000s, okay? And what started to happen was one of the outcomes of the lawsuits, we actually had one in Massachusetts, and one of the outcomes of the lawsuit was that the state was um, required to use a third party administrator, okay, to administer the claims because it was believed that it would be more efficient and that more people would get into care. Now, when we talk about third party administer administrators, we're talking about an entity, an administrative entity that simply, and I'm really oversimplifying, but simply pays the claims, okay? And, um, but the Medicaid program has a lot more responsibilities under law than just paying claims, right? There's a lot more. And much, is, much of it is making sure that eligibles actually receive services, get into dental offices and actually receive services. And these were some of the issues that came out in some of these lawsuits in the early 2000s. So states started to say, you know what? There's some private entities, commercial dental insurance companies, they can do this much better than us. We're gonna, we're gonna partner with them. And as they started to partner with these third party administrators, um, they started sharing more of the responsibility. And so the federal government came out with um, a managed care law. And I believe that law came out in 2016, which really defined a lot of the responsibilities that managed care plans needed to uphold and that states had to um, comply with 
in their relationships with these, you know, corporate vendors, okay, to administer their programs. So the managed care rule or the managed care final rule, um, again, has tremendous, tremendous um, detail about how managed care plans should and need to operate. But, but then what began happening, and this was really adding some complexity, is some states said, we're not going to, we are not going to, um, contract with just one managed care organization. We're going to contract with several because if we contract with several, that will create competition. And that means the vendors will have to lower their prices. So now you have a, a perfect scenario of public private, okay, but you also have competition among the private corporate organizations. And I'm going to show you some slides of how some states just have one vendor and some states have multiple. Okay, but in addition to that, they had issues of risk versus um, non risk versus shared risk. So, what does risk mean when we use the word risk in Medicaid or, or, or a state sharing risk? It doesn't mean liability. Okay, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean patients getting hurt and dentist dental liability, it does not mean that at all. It means financial risk. So we talked about how the states have to balance their budget each year, right? So there's a fixed dollar amount or an estimated dollar amount that they have um, created to run their program for the next year. Now they're either gonna run it like North Carolina with their budget in-house in a traditional fee-for-service model, or they're gonna take those dollars and they're gonna give them to um, a, a portion of them to a third party administrator who's gonna manage the claims and do the administrative piece, or they're gonna give a, a bigger chunk of it to a managed care organization who is going to manage more of those required services that they are required under federal law to uphold and to deliver to their population. But some states don't want to, want to hold on to that risk. They wanna, because, when you maintain financial risk, when a state maintains financial risk, they have full control of the program. But in some states, they're willing to share that risk with a managed care entity. Okay, we're gonna give you the responsibility of getting a dental network, of upholding the network, of getting people into care, and we're gonna hold you accountable to that, okay? And we're gonna to begin to measure and make sure that you get at least 40%, 50%, 60% of children in for a preventive service or 30% in for a dental sealant. And so, you know, this notion of quality, right? And performance, okay, began to emerge and to really take hold with managed care and this issue of shared risk. And so, so when we talk about risk, we now know that most states that actually do have some kind of a program in some kind of a managed care um, plan, okay? Because most Medicaid programs have several programs uh, and most of them do have managed care plans that they contract with. Um, and in most scenarios, but not all, they share that financial risk. And so that gives the plan the opportunity to be creative and to do things that a state may not do, but it also gives um, the vendor, okay, the corporate vendor, um, the opportunity to try to try different things to make more money. And if they make more money at the end of the year, they get to keep it. And if they lose, okay, then they lose. And that's the shared risk. That's the whole idea of shared risk, okay? Now we're gonna talk about carve in versus carve out. You may have heard that terminology before. So, in a traditional fee-for-service, we said the state manages the whole program, pays the providers themselves, or they have a third-party administrator, okay, who pays the providers the, um, the fee for services delivered through claims, um, you know, um, payments. In a carve-in versus carve-out situation, that means that the vendor, the corporate vendor, either has a direct relationship with the state where the vendor receives dollars from the state or the vendor, the dental vendor in this case, is a subcontractor of a medical managed care. 
So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. In the state of Arizona, okay, Arizona has, let's just say, 500,000 Medicaid beneficiaries. The state has to, in, this, in their Medicaid program, has to provide medical services and dental services. This is a state that has opted to use more than one managed care, to, to contract with more than one managed care program because of competition or in other reasons, they've decided to do that, okay. Instead of contracting with a number of medical managed care programs to administer medical services, and then a number of dental managed care companies to administer dental, they just contract with medical managed care organizations. And it becomes the medical MCO's responsibility to figure out how they're gonna get dental services to those members that they are responsible to, for, all right? So you get a big company like an Aetna or United Healthcare that has medical and dental under their umbrella, they may have the contract and they you know, can deliver it because it's all in-house. But there are other medical MCOs that do not have dental under their umbrella. They still have received the contract, but as part of getting that contract, they had to have a subcontract with a dental vendor, right? Like a Delta Dental Plan, okay? Or an MCNA or an Abesis Dental, right? And so, so we have these carved in programs where the state contracts with medical and the dental is part of that umbrella, all right? But then in some states, like, like um, Arkansas, for instance, you have a, a, a state Medicaid program that has medical MCOs only, okay? And then they have, I believe, there's two dental um, MCOs. And the two dental MCOs are also, are, are carved out and not under the umbrella of the MCO. They don't subcontract from the MCO they get to talk directly to the state, okay? And so their contracts are directly with the state. All right, so that's the difference between a carve in and a carve out. Now let's talk about how payment is generated. When you talk about fee for service and when you talk about um, uh, PMPM, per member, per month, or per member, per year payments, there's two levels of payment, okay? when a state moves to out of a traditional fee-for-service model to a managed care model. Dental providers in a traditional fee-for-service model like North Carolina get paid by the state the fee-for-service. They submit the claims, they get paid, okay. In a managed care model, the state gives a chunk of money, we said, to the vendor right, to the managed care plan. The managed care plan uses a portion of those dollars to administer, right, to have their employees and to administer the program. But the bulk of those dollars goes to pay the dentist. The dentist still get paid a fee for service. So in other words, the way in which dentists are being paid today in this country is the same, whether they are in a traditional fee for service model program, or whether they are in an MCO. By and large, now, by and large, there are some exceptions to this, which we'll talk about, but by and large. So, so the dentists still submit claims, whether it's directly to the state or whether it's to a vendor, and they get paid a fee for service. However, the vendors don't get paid fee for service from the state. They get paid a per member, per month fee, right? for each member that is enrolled that month in their health plan. So two levels of payment, okay, when we talk about, okay, um, and so traditional fee-for-service, always to the provider by and large, we haven't, we haven't done much beyond that um, yet, but, um, but when we talk about managed care, it's a PMPM payment from the state to the vendor. Okay, I hope folks got that. That can be a little tricky. Again, so now when we talk about policies, right? We talked about how they how policies vary by state, but that how policies, we always apply these four levels to the policies. They can change overnight, you know, due to any, any reason at all. 
Now, this slide, again, this is one of my old slides and it's, it's here. So the next several slides are older, but they're designed just to provide an example of how states administer their programs and the type of variability that we have. I talked already about um, fiscal responsibility and risk sharing. And this slide basically shows you the percentage of states that um, this again was back in 2016. This changes, okay, but basically how many states were had 100% but were, were maintaining risk, full risk, and how states were sharing. And so again, it changes, it's all over the place, okay? Again, this is another slide that basically shows how states were sharing fiscal responsibility with vendors at this time. Um, and again, I, I'll, I'll tell you the reason why we don't have updated update updated data here is because when the pandemic hit, um, states were just you know just overwhelmed with other responsibilities that you can imagine how long it takes them to fill out these questionnaires and send this data to us. We're now in the process of, of updating this data, so. Next time we do this, Gina, we'll, we'll have um, more updated data. Um, but you get an idea, right? The idea is to show you how um, different states manage their programs and, and are willing to give up that fiscal responsibility or not, right, with, um, with vendors. Again, the CHIP program back in the day, this is how the CHIP program, sometimes they would test it, right? They'd, 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 They'd share it and give it give it off because it was a smaller program and they they tested. Let's see how it's going to work with the chip program. If they like the way in which the vendors worked and how it happened, they would they'd expand it to their Medicaid program. Okay, so now let's talk about dental provider reimbursement. Um, by and large, you can see um, we have states that are still paying um, a fee for service despite our move to value based care, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, in value-based care, meaning um, paying for performance or performance measurement or incentives, if you will. Um, at the end of the day, if we in dentistry still by and large pay our dental providers um, fee-for-service. Um, now, when we talk about non-dental provider reimbursement and we look at CDT codes and CPT codes, we asked states how many states at the time were actually paying medical providers for the delivery of dental you know, um, dental services. And um, basically what we saw that um, we saw this type of um, CDT and CPT um, by Medicaid and CHIP programs. Now this slide, again, this is back in 2016 and this has changed, but the purpose of this slide is to show you the variability in the number of contractors dental um, programs use. All right, so if you look here again, this particular was Oregon. They had 15 different managed care contractors. They call them CCOs um, in, in Oregon. If you looked at Illinois, again, 10 different contractors. So the question you look at here, when you look at this is to say, which is the best practice, right? And this is something we haven't done yet. And this is something we, this is a great, study. If any of you dental public health residents want to study something, this would be a phenomenal thing to study because now we're at 2022, right? And now we want to look at what are the outcomes? If we have, if we're a state that has 15 contractors versus a state that has one or two, which state or which states are able to deliver more services, right? Are our outcomes better, right? One versus the other. Great study, I don't have the answer for that, but that would be a wonderful study. This is just an example of how Arizona managed you know, their care. Remember I showed you all the different vendors they had. So in the left-hand column, this was again back in 2016. At the time they had 11 M, stands for medical, medical MCOs, right? And these MCOs, again, could have been, could have been, um, hired, contracted for various, based on a special population or for a specific geographic location, okay? So we talked about different programs. And here's the interesting thing, is that one Medicaid program, we said a few minutes ago, is one Medicaid program. But now if you have 11 different MCOs in a state or 11 different dental MCOs in a state, 
than the services delivered in even the reimbursement rates in the same state, okay, across 11 different MCOs could be different. So imagine you're a dental provider in Arizona and you live in an in a geographic area where you are part of this plan and part of this plan, okay? You could have totally different benefits and totally different um, reimbursement rates, the same benefits, okay, based on the various different plans. So lots of variability. That is not gonna change anytime soon. So it's just, it's competition, it's competition. Okay, this gives you an idea of what the dental Medicaid, um, you know, the expenditures were. Um, average dental expenditures for adults dental and Medicaid back then and what they were. Okay, now obviously this has definitely changed, but again, you get an idea of where we were at. In this particular slide, we asked states, we wanted to know if they paid for school-based services. And we were really surprised to see that many states didn't, you know, and um, we were pretty upset by that. But um, again, you know, this is where we have work to do, right? If, if school-based programs, and this is really important, if school-based programs wanna be covered and wanna be considered sustainable, they, they should, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, they should not be considered a public health program because in the eyes of dollars and cents, they get funneled and then public health dollars have to support them. I believe public health dollars should be used to seed these programs and get them up and running where they are needed, right? Once we identify where disparities lie. But once they are up and running, they really need to transition and become actual access points in the delivery system, right? That can be covered totally by Medicaid and any other insurer that, that would be insuring you know, children. So something to think about as we think about how we can evolve our models, our school-based models to become more efficient and more sustainable. So FQHC data clinic, data um, dental claims. And so, um, so one of the things we learned back in the day was that um, if we look at the program data that comes in from each state each year, and let's look at sealants, you know, we look at um, healthy people, right? And back in the day, we looked at what was the healthy people um, 2010 or 2020 um, goal for sealants, right? And back, back in the early 2000s, it was, I think it was close to 50%. We wanted 50% of six and seven year old kids to have to receive a dental sealant. Well, what we found is that children that were receiving these services and FQHCs weren't included in the data because FQHCs by and large submit only um, uh, um, um, what, what they call encounter data. And, and they don't have, when they get paid for services, it doesn't matter whether they just have one service or um, a series of services, they get one bundled payment. And oftentimes states did not collect that CDT level. So we didn't know if a child that had a preventive service at an FQHC actually received um, a dental sealant. We didn't know that, we couldn't capture that. So look at across the states where only encounter data was collected, we, that data was obviously, those services were obviously underreported, okay? Um, adult preventive, we also looked at adults. So we said earlier that adult dental services are not mandated under federal law. Again, this is back in 2016, and we wanted to know the number of states that actually had some kind of dental preventive benefit. And you can see this is where states were, okay, back then. <clears throat> when we look at adult dental benefits, dentures and extractions, it's sad to see that more states did cover that. But again, this has changed a lot, going back to this last slide, that a lot of this has really changed a lot more states are, are, are becoming um, much more aware of the costs associated with, with lack of dental care and are really, <clears throat> are really trying to address that. <clears throat> now, this is a slide that I purposefully put here to demonstrate policy, orthodontic policy. Now, we talked about medical necessity. We said that all children 
are eligible under EPSDT to receive any medical necessity, any medically necessary services, right? But how do you decide what services are necessary? Well, you're gonna be pretty surprised to hear that the dentist is not the person that determines whether or not a child sitting in the chair is eligible or requires medical necessity, okay? Or that their ortho is medical necessity. These are two different ortho um, um, scores that, um, that are used, indices that are used to determine ortho policy. And what I wanna show you here is the variability. So you have the Salzman minimum index right here, right? Now in Pennsylvania, so this is a checklist, right? Of different criteria that a child sitting in the dental chair needs to um, demonstrate in order to qualify from, for, for their ortho, okay, to be paid for by the Medicaid agency. So if we look at Pennsylvania, that child needs to have 25 items or criteria checked off to be eligible for an ortho benefit in the state. Look at Illinois. A child in Illinois can't get that same ortho benefit that we're talking about that kids in Pennsylvania are getting unless there's 42 items checked off. Okay, so this is, is a perfect example of how medical necessity is not determined by the dental provider, but is determined by state. And how state policy and benefits are one of those levers that we use to control costs, right? And it's sad to say that this is how we have to control costs, but again, we understand there's that balancing that state budget every year. So again, look at the variability here on the HLD minimum score index, okay? It's amazing, isn't it? To me, this was pretty fascinating. Risk-based care, again, going back to risk-based at the time, we looked at the number of states using Cary's risk assessment, okay? And at the time, there were very few using it. States are still not really using that risk assessment, those risk assessments. Some states are, and they're paying just a minimal amount. I know that Oklahoma, they, they implemented the, the three risk-based codes. And, um, and they only put a $3, but guess what? All the providers were using it. So if we really want to promote, then we have to um, make sure that we reimburse at some level. Um, quality measurement, states using Dental Quality Alliance. So are we, are we doing okay on time here, Dr. Thornton Evans? You doing okay? Um, well, we do actually have a question in the chat. Okay. Okay, uh, go to sure. that if we can do that. Sure. Yes. Um, let's see. Um, the first question was related to the benefit of the managed care um, organization prof, um, models versus the um, standard fee for service. Yeah. And what was the question? What the, the difference, what, which one is more beneficial when you, oh, <laughs> so you're asking great questions, right? <laughs> yes. So, so I'll tell you, I started with MISDA back in 2009 and many of you know, and as, as you told folks, um, Dr. Thornton Evans, I was the state dental director for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I was a member of the association of state and territorial dental directors and, and played a big role with initially with, um, ASTDD's best practices. Okay. And so when I started with Medicaid with MISDA, one of the first things that we wanted to roll out was best practices to try to understand which of these models really delivered the kinds of outcomes, which, which would be really a best practice. And what we learned really early on was that all of a sudden Medicaid was in transition. We had shipper legislation that came out in 2009. We had the Affordable Care Act that came out in 2010, right? And there was so much disruption in traditional programs that we really couldn't measure anything or deem anything a best practice. Now these programs have been rolled out for 10 years. This is the time to start it. So again, I would encourage any dental resident, okay, that is wanting to do a study, there's some really powerful studies and data 
out there that could answer these questions, which is better, traditional fee for service. You know, the state of California still has a traditional fee for service program. Now they have met, they have managed care, but they only have it in two counties, in LA County and Sacramento County. And so you have to ask, why does a state, a huge state like California, still have a traditional fee for service program? They, they have a vendor, a third party administrator that actually pays those claims, but they have full control over the program by and large, and they still pay for it. Yet why does a state like Arizona choose to have close to 15 medical managed care organizations that have to handle dental as well in a carbon model. So I don't know the answers to this, but I can tell you every one of those questions are fabulous, fabulous research questions that we really should start to answer. No, thank you, Ms. Foley. And if there's any other questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, one other question, Ms. Foley, and I, I know that you probably have a few more slides, but if you don't mind, sure. just for the essence of time, um, what would you say has been the biggest impact with respect to um, COVID in terms of the delivery of care? I know we've seen some CMS data from Dr. Chalmers. What has been what you've observed and how do you think um, in terms of preparedness, emergency preparedness, what we can do better in the future? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm, I haven't, I'm not... I didn't put any slides in on preparedness, but, but you know, I was with the Commonwealth again as a dental public health person. Okay, um, back in um, you know when September um, 11th hit. Okay, so and we weren't really prepared back then, 9/11, right? And COVID, same thing. And and so what can we do? We we always have to be ready, right? We always have to be ready. We have to be prepared for for the unthinkable. One of the things I think we, we get caught up, we, we have so much today in our lives. We have so much that we, we take for granted, right? And we just keep going and going and going. And I think COVID has really, um, really caused us to pause and to say, what can we do differently? How can we be ready? And I think um, teledentistry is a phenomenal example of how um, we, can, we can better prepare. And, and by having policies, so one of the things that MISDA, that our organization did, and one of the things we try to do ongoing is to understand, is to be out in front, right? Is to look for innovation and to look for things that are coming down the road and to um, understand how they can help Medicaid state programs, okay? And to package them in a way that people understand them, but to also help develop policy and have that policy ready. So directly to answer your question, the answer is to have policies ready to pull out of that drawer and implement. One of the things I personally learned with COVID was how swiftly the federal government stepped in and relaxed regulation, right? So mm -hmm. that people and states were able. And a perfect example of this was um, the HIPAA loss, right? Mm -hmm. And, and devices, you know, devices that were considered non-compliant devices versus all of a sudden now, because the, some of these HIPAA laws were relaxed, we could use um, iPhones, right? We could use smartphones to have televisits with healthcare professionals. And so I think it's really essential to look at the way in which states administer their programs now to consider if there was an event that providers and patients could not, you know, or that patients could not access their, their providers. What kind of policy should we have in place? And I think teledentistry is a perfect example. Many states aren't ready to really open that floodgate for teledental visits yet. Dentists aren't ready. Dentists want to see the patient in the chair. That's how they've been trained. But I think we really need to take the lessons that we've learned from COVID and to see how we can see more people more regularly and how we can expand that teledental visit from what's now really more of a problem focused exam. That's how it's typically billed as, problem, as a problem focused um, assessment or evaluation to preventive. You know, there was a couple of FQHCs in California that I thought were incredibly innovative. And one of them actually put together dental kits all right, with fluoride varnish in them and mailed them to their families of, of young children. And then th they would set up a teledental visit, okay, a preventive 
teledental visit. And during that, there would be oral health education, anticipatory guidance to the parent, and instruction on brushing. The parent would brush the child's teeth and the parent would apply the fluoride varnish. And the FQHC was able to build the state Medicaid program through for a tele-dental encounter visit. And I think that was phenomenal. So states and administrators need to have a policy ready to pull out of their drawer and, and, and implement. And I think that's the most important thing you can do. Yes, thank you so much, um, um, Ms. Foley, for just an excellent presentation. And I, I apologize that we've run out of time and everything, sure. but I wanted to ask if those are in, individuals are interested, if they could reach out to you for some additional questions that they might have and sure. if they um, would like to see the slides or something like that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I don't think there's any more questions um, but I know that, um, yeah, uh, since we've kind of gone over, um, okay, there's time for one more question then. Um, and the question is, is that uh, they were happy to hear about you mentioning telehealth or teledentistry. Um, are there any Medicaid benefits um, paying for emerging technology like um, yeah. toothbrushes um, to support behavior changes that support oral health? Well, I am glad you brought up technology. So um, devices, unfortunately, dental devices, I think um, they're kind of slow to be paid for. I haven't seen, I haven't seen, Medicaid pays for services. Think about that. They pay for services. Um, one of the things we tried to do during the pandemic was we tried to get um, state Medicaid agencies to pay for advanced infection control. Remember when CDC came out with the advanced um, infection control guidelines. And so we, we reframed it as and created a policy saying that it wasn't, it wasn't paying for their time. It was paying for um, advanced services and advanced protection for the population. And, um, but states, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, you know. Yeah, well, thank, thank you again, Ms. Foley. We really, really appreciate, um, you know, an excellent presentation. And on behalf of the Division of Oral Health and our division director, Mr. Casey Hannon, I just want to definitely thank you again for um, just putting forth a really excellent presentation. And just to let the individuals on the call, um, especially those that are residents that are planning to take the written exam or um, planning to take the qualifying exam, um, Ms. Foley gave an excellent overview, and she actually covered about maybe, I think I counted 10 questions that are on the written exam, and actually maybe about five that you could potentially be asked on the um, certifying exam. So this was very, um, you know, a great presentation, and it gave a really good overview of several of the dental public health competencies. So we thank you so much um, for your time today, and apologize not allowing enough time to get through all of your great material. That's okay. There's a few more good slides. And so we'll post them on MISD's website, medicaiddental.org. Okay? okay. I'll post them right on the homepage um, a little bit later on, but you'll be able to access them there. Okay. www.medicaiddental.org. How's that? Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Foley. This is excellent. I really appreciate it. And everyone for attending today. We really appreciate your time and we will be announcing the next um, lecture series that should take place in November. So look out for more information um, as it becomes available. And thank you so much, all of you, and have a great day. Thank you, Ms. Foley.